Once again, we are thankful for your um, introduction to our time of worship together this morning. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to introduce the people who are here in the meeting house before we introduce the people on Zoom and then sing a hymn. We have this morning Gage Stemmer, who's back with us. Yay, Gage. We have um, Kay Mendenhall and Suzanne Weber. We have Ellen Craig and her son Kent and Nicole and Evie and Hazel are all here with us today. It is wonderful to have you guys here this morning. Thank you. We have Eileen Critch and Shirley Ertle. I'm glad to see you guys this morning. We have Dave Longnecker and Brian Lilly and Dennis Engel. We have Susan Simons and her daughter, Jill Simons. So this must be uh, family day, huh? <laughs> and they are sitting right next to Norman Karen Peters. Um, we have Doug and Kathy Simmons who are here this morning and Kendra Holliger, yay. We have the, the wandering um, dentist back, yay. <laughs> it's good to see you. And we have Marsha Holliger who is here this morning and Rob and Val Pearson and Lois Hogue. They're um, sitting here. Thank you for being present. And Mary Clark and Ron and I. So those are the people that are here in the building on, on this day and I'm thankful for each of you being here. On Zoom this morning, we have um, Delmer Ferguson and Dwight Ferguson from Overland Park, Kansas. Welcome, it's good to see you guys this morning. We have Al and Linda Groth from um, out west of town. Welcome, Al and Linda. We have Keith Kendall from Friends Fellowship down at Richmond. Welcome, Keith. We have Bill and Joyce Wagner from Muncie, Indiana. Welcome, Bill and Joyce. We have Cliff Painter, who is here with us from um, Calaveras County. California. Thank you, Cliff, for being present. We have Kenny Gurton and Therese, Teresa Wallace here from, it looks like they're out at Summers Point together this morning, so it's good to see you guys this morning. We have Terry and Sharon Reinard who are here with us from east of Winchester. Welcome, Terry and Sharon. We have Nancy Wolf who is here with us from Greenfield. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Jeff Clark from east of Winchester, it's good to see you. And Kathy Burton, it's good to see you from your home here in Winchester. Good to have you here. And Nita Burton, she's probably in Indian, Indianapolis, I think. Yep, it's good to see Nita Burton here this morning. We also have Jan McVeigh, who has been with us in the past, um, but she is from uh, way Western Indiana, and um, we are happy to have you here, Jan. Thank you for being present. I think she's still recovering from uh, jet lag. She has been spent the last couple weeks at least in uh, Kenya for the Friends United Meeting Triennial, two weeks. So, so she's home today with jet lag. So thank you for being present with us. I appreciate it. We also have Tony and Marcia Critch who are here with us from west of Winchester and Janet Ross who is here with us from Winchester. So, and Valerie Boyd, um, I'm just admitting her. Valerie is um, a cousin of ours, and she is from Wichita, Kansas. And so it is good to have Valerie here this morning. So thank you all for being present, and I think we're going to sing a hymn. This is hymn number 404 in the hymnal, so if you'd like to turn to that. And it says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, so I doubt whether we ought to sit when we sing this. So if you would, you are able and would like to stand here in the room, you're welcome to do that. You're welcome to stand at home too, if you'd like. The solid rock.
much. You may be seated. I wish all of you could be here in the room to hear <laughs> hear that. That's pretty special. Um, just one word. One of the things that made me think of that hymn is the third verse, the second line of the third verse. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Just reminded me of the line that's in the essay that we sent out last night um, about slipping into a post-truth world. That's what it feels like when all around my, gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. I hope that his truth is your hope and stay. This morning, I'm going to talk about the testimonies this, and the, uh, the spice, spices testimony. I long ago, probably 20 years ago, Ann Riddle gave me this um, little plaque and it hangs in my kitchen. And I've heard several people say, aha, that's the Quaker motto, kind of like Semper Fi for the Marines, isn't it? <laughs> that, that, and so this is, this is the Quaker motto. Well, um, yes and no. <laughs> we, we are, we are, we live in a world that is, um, motto based, um, uh, logo based. You have to have a, a logo, logo to make it worthwhile. Um, so it's a good reminder that life is more than, um, material things, but, um, simplify. I wanted to just, um, Scott Wagner wrote this description of the testimonies. He says, Quakers are often known to use the simple acronym SPICES to describe the testimonies, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. I find these helpful, but often wonder how they translate outside the meeting house walls. So I'm always in search of how I can reframe them in a language that can connect with someone who isn't a Quaker. So here is one attempt. Number one, keep your life clutter free of all that is unnecessary and instead focus on what really matters, simplicity. Two, daily practices, forgiveness, reconciliation, apologizing and mending relationships, peace. Three, live authentically, truthfully and honestly as possible and integrate your values into your actions. Integrity. Four, don't do life alone and value the power of relationships. Community. Five, treat everyone you meet fairly and with dignity. Equality. And six, give back to life and contribute to the flourishing of the common good. Stewardship. I think that's a very simple explanation of, of spices, but it's also, especially the one about integrity, reminded me that we live in a world where what we say needs to match what we do. It's a simple thing. Um, last, about the end of, or no, it was the end of April, um, Earlham School of Religion had a leadership conference and they had Parker Palmer speak at, who's a famous writer and educator, speak about, um, speak to these Quakers about leadership. And it was just kind of interesting to me in all the questions that they asked um, Parker Palmer after he spoke, 
they were more interested in how can we make our institutions a little bit better and um, how we can uh, uh, basically how we can be more diverse, how we can be um, great leaders in this world. And Park, Parker Palmer, in he got kind of I I could tell he was kind of tired of answering all these questions about how we do things, and he said, you know, I I rem want to remember that Quakerism is not is a movement and not a re an established religion. Again, Quakerism is a movement and not an established religion. So Christianity is a lifestyle, a way of being in the world that is simple, nonviolent, shared, and loving. However, we make it into an established religion and all that goes with this and avoid the lifestyle change itself. One could be warlike, greedy, racist, selfish, and vain in most of Christianity's history, and still believe that Jesus is one's personal Savior and Lord. The world has had time, does not have time for such silliness anymore. The suffering of the earth is too great, and that's from Richard Rohr. The suffering of the world is too great for us not to live with integrity, not to let our actions belie what lies in our heart. That is an important thing. So thank you all for being present this morning. At the expense of a couple of minutes, I'm going to read two passages of scripture because I think these are both really important to this topic of truthful integrity. And this is mostly a reminder, you know the sort of basics of this story, but it's good to hear it once in a while. This is found in the fifth chapter of Acts. It's after the church has started to get itself organized a little bit in Jerusalem, after some of the disciples have been arrested for healing a guy and hauled into court and the religious leaders after that first arrest saw that this was going to be a losing battle because everyone was thrilled with what the disciples had been doing and so they gave them stern warnings and let them go and then it says that they began sharing resources among themselves so that there were no poor among the christian community there they had some hellenistic jews um, Jews that were not Palestinian, but rather came from the Grecian world that were there. And they were being discriminated against by the locals. Nobody in Indiana knows anything about that, right? But they formed a feeding committee to take care of those Grecian Jews, especially the widows and women and people that couldn't provide for themselves. And Acts chapter 5 then tells us, what happened after people saw that feeding committee starting to work. A man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet for this feeding committee. Then Peter, who was there, said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for selling that land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward and wrapped up his body and carried him out to be buried. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Obviously, it wasn't on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? She went right along with the lie. Yes, she said, that's the price. And Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. And the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. 
and great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. It is verse 4 that is just so shocking. You have not lied to people. You have lied to God and thought you could get away with it. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 speaks of the importance of speaking truthfully to one another when he says these things. This is Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11. It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, after we attain to the full measure of the fullness of Christ, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and build itself up in love as each part does its work. That passage just highlights so profoundly the importance of truthful integrity in the body of Christ. It is loving to be truthfully honest with one another. It is unloving not to be. And it is through love that the body of Christ will be built up as, as Paul wrote there. I just want to stress two or three things from what we sent out last evening. And then we would really like to hear what God has been speaking to you about. First of all, I am just, <laughs> I was bowled over when I heard that guy on the radio this week use that phrase, we are slipping into a post-truth world. And we don't want to live there. That is just like being condemned to live in a den of snakes. You don't want to have to live like that. And what it means is that in a world like that, and a world like this is now, because I think, as I said in that essay, I'm afraid the slippage has already started, already taken place. In a world like that, the followers of Christ should stick out like a sore thumb. We should stand out as that Scripture passage says, like bright stars in a pitch black sky. That's what truthful integrity looks like in a world that is post-truth. And the challenge to Christ's followers is to be those lights, to be those stars in that dark sky. I hope if you carry nothing else away from this that you will remember that. We are responsible to be those witnesses for Christ's kingdom of truth. The second thing that I would stress, the little paragraph that I wrote about the testimonies, seems kind of important as we begin to look at all of those five or six or seven testimonies as part of this series on Friends' unique expression of Christ's gospel. And that is that these testimonies are not a checklist. They are not a to-do list of, oh, well, after I've accomplished this, then I've arrived and the kingdom of God is mine. Not that at all. These are the results of inner work, not a checklist of outer things to mark off and say, mission accomplished. These are the qualities, these spices that Pam has just mentioned, are the qualities that are produced when Christ is truly put in charge in our souls. They are the result of Christ's presence and freedom to act within us. That's a really important concept to remember as well. The third thing is, and this review of Ananias and Sapphira is the, the reason that I <clears throat> wanted to do that. Self-honesty is the very ground floor of the life of discipleship. Until we can be honest enough to admit our need for God, which is poverty of spirit, until we are honest enough to 
confess the damage that sin does and continues to do in the world and in our community and in my own life, if I let it, until we are honest enough to admit that I can't fix this, and if Christ doesn't do it, it won't happen in meekness, turning to him and asking for his help. Until we can be that honest with ourselves, there is no place for us to begin in the life of discipleship, except there. Because whatever else we would do without that first basic step of honesty with self is going to end up not working out very well. And the fourth thing that I would simply stress is that honesty, um, integrity, consistency is essential to every other part of life for Jesus followers. That's why I listed off all those things on the back page of this printed thing. We, we must have truthful integrity in our communications, in our relationships, in the marketplace, in legal matters, and in everything else in life as well. It is an all-inclusive principle of following Christ. It has to be done with truthful integrity. Those are the things that we really want you, I really want you to take away from this. Queries that we've posed at the end of the essay are these. Number one, what other aspects of life besides those listed above need to be infused with and conducted in truthful integrity? I couldn't possibly list all of the areas of life where truthful integrity is essential. You may think of some that I didn't include here. Your response to that query would be most appreciated. Number two, why is truthful integrity so essential to Christian witness and to the effective functioning of faith communities? Why is it so important within the body of Christ? Number three, what examples of truthful integrity do you know of in the Bible? What examples of truthful integrity's absence are you aware of? Just gave you a couple. What should we learn from those examples? And number four, how might we choose not to participate in greedflation? Um, one of the things we heard on the radio again this week was that we are in a time of greedflation. A lot of economists are saying that it is dishonesty by businesses that have caused this inflation and is resisting bringing it back down where it belongs. So how can we choose not to participate in that greedflation? How might we help people who are struggling with just not being able to afford to live? And then three bonus queries that I've put in the chat, but you folks here in the room may need to just jot these down if you want to respond to them. Why is truthful integrity an essential component of friends' other testimonies? Those testimonies that Pam listed of simplicity, peace, community, equality, and stewardship. If you think about it, none of those other testimonies actually work unless we live them with truthful integrity. Why is truthful integrity an essential component of the rest of our witness? Number six, how might communicating true information sometimes violate Christ's principle of truth? I would guess that every person sitting in the room today and every person online has probably been a victim of that. Sometimes true information is wielded like a cudgel and they beat the tar out of you with it. You may want to reference an example of that. And number seven, why is it or why isn't it still an important witness for truth to affirm in court rather than swear an oath in court. Is that just a goofy thing from the past that we really ought to not talk about anymore? Or is that still an important thing, not to swear oaths, but to affirm that we tell the truth? Those are the queries that we pose to you. There may be other things that have come to your mind, other truth that you have learned we hope that you will feel free to obey the prompting of the Spirit to speak out of the silence as we wait quietly in the Lord's presence for a few minutes. You are most welcome to do that. If you are online, you'll need to be sure and unmute. Pam will be here to try to help you. 
here in the room. I will have the mobile microphone and we'll be running around the room. Thank you, friends, so much. It is just wonderful to see you all today. Thank you for being with us this morning. Right now, as we're reading through the Bible over the course of the year, we're largely reading through the prophets. Right now, it's Isaiah, but we still have some major prophets to go as well as minor prophets. I'd like to take this opportunity to recommend a little book that can be read uh, perhaps in one sitting by some of you, but by Howard Macy, entitled Befriending the Prophets. Howard, who taught at George Fox University, um, has brought together a lot of wonderful thoughts about that in this, in this small book. And this morning, as I was reading, I came across this uh, the chapter on compelling vision. 
he talks about three words, pardon me, four words that for him really stand out as anchor words that the prophets used and that we need to be using or living in these days. And those words are justice and righteousness and love. And then they're anchored by truth, truth. I like to think of those four as kind of like a mixed quartet. Each one is important in its own right, but together they really lead to a harmony of life that leads to um, peace or what he called shalom. I appreciated Ron putting together the two words, truthful integrity, but they too stand in their own right. You cannot have integrity without truth, nor can you have truth without integrity. But Howard Macy anchors those four basic principles, biblical principles of justice, righteousness, love, anchors them with truth. And I find that really compelling. Would that we could live out each one of those anchors in our daily lives. Howard says they're really practical, very practical aspects of living. Would that we could make them practical day to day to day. Amen. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, I find some of your queries are rather difficult to answer, but uh, truth, truth is so important. Truthful integrity is so important because I believe it is the very thing that drew me to Jesus to begin with. It is the very thing that drew me there was the intentional and relentless pursuit of the truth that I couldn't seem to find elsewhere. And when Jesus starts speaking the truth so clearly, so proudly, so unapologetically, if we don't have the integrity, we don't allow that truth to convict ourselves. And that's where it really all begins is once the truth begins to convict us, then we realize how far from the truth, how far from the life and the, and the way we've, we've gotten. And it pushes us, it inspires us to be more humble, to be more honest, to have greater expectation of ourselves. So I think it all belong, uh, it all begins there. It all starts with that. That's the thing that attracted me so much to Jesus was that he said things that no one else seemed to have the courage to say. And when I read them and truly weighed them on my heart, I couldn't help but recognize he was the truth. Thank you. Pat, do you want unmuted? Okay. You are unmuted. Thank you. Um, on the subject of integrity, I've been kind of pondering or <clears throat> thinking a lot about that in the last month or so. Um, people are hurting. They don't have money. And I feel very bad about that but then when i go like i don't know to a store and some things on set not even to a store more like a farm market or something i'm always looking for the sale things mm -hmm. and especially this time of year the plants and we have a little farmer's market down the road or red barn it's called and they keep marking the plants down and i keep kept waiting for them <clears throat> to go lower and then I thought I'm having a problem with that because if if I'm not paying what they think it's worth then am I really practicing my integrity if they think that plant's worth ten dollars but they had to mark it down to five because no one was buying it what's the message for me in that should I feel good because I found it for five dollars and had a bargain or should I feel bad because I, I don't know, cheated is the right word, but I have uh, kept them out of their profit. Hmm. That's, that's what I've been thinking. <laughs> Thank you.
I'll, I'll address number four, and that is uh, choosing not to participate in greedflation. It would seem to me that if we all grow a garden, then we're going to avoid a lot of those high prices at the store and share with your neighbor. Buy your meat locally from a farmer. To me, a garden is what I love to do. So maybe not everybody feels that way. Some people can't because of where they live. I'm sure of that. But it's easy enough if you plant a little extra and share it with your neighbors. Thank you. Well, I, I like to th think that I tell the truth, and I think I, I, I try to. I think sometimes when we get to examining what, what is being truthful, and when you combine it with the things that Bill mentioned, I, whether I can even hold four things in my mind and get them out, I'm not sure, but it, the, the love part of being truthful is is a quotient there, I think, that we need to look at. I, and I think what Patsy said is the same thing. I think we always get a little, oh, we found a blouse that we had looked at, and now they've marked it down. Oh, wow. You know, I've, I've made a find, and that's great. But somebody made that. Somebody, you know, and it may have been overpriced to begin with, we're wondering. But it's hard to know what is being honest and loving to, you know, whoever is selling something. And I think in, in giving things is good, but Patsy and I had a good teacher on how to find a good sale, and that was Patsy's mom. And Patsy and I have followed it for years. And sometimes I think that's okay. It's already marked down. Somebody's going to get that sale merchandise or whatever. If you save some money, maybe you could figure out what you could do with that money that might help somebody. So maybe maybe that's what we're going to have to do, because we still like to find a good buy, I think. <laughs> Thanks.
I think we need to be truthful with ourselves too. Often we, well, I had to personalize that. Often I find myself trying to do something that I think I should be able to handle myself. Just generally get in the thick of it and realize I'm way over my head. I have to bring it before the Lord and say, I can't do this. I want to do it. I should be able to do this, but I can't do this. It's like he's saying to me, well, that's why I'm here for you. I'm here to help. You're trying to do things that you should not be tempting on your own. It's a spiritual realm, not a physical one. I'm reminded I have to depend on him. Not just for the way that I'm setting up things. I'm reminded that I need him all the time. I guess he gives me wisdom and insight into things, but the bottom line is I still need him every day, all day. Thank you. Uh, so I'm mulling over a thought process, and I'll try to make this comprehensible, I guess. Um, we've been talking about the truth, and we've also been talking about simplicity. Um, I was remembering a conversation ago I had a while back with a friend of mine, and we were talking about what is the truth and um, how do you determine what is true. Um, and I think so, I remember someone mentioning, like, the truth is complicated. And I was thinking, about that for a while, and I think that's wrong. I think the truth is the, tr the truth. It's absolute and it's singular. What makes the truth complicated is when it's tied with lies and deception. Um, and a lot of the most, um, a lot of the lies that we tell ourselves, a lot of our justifications and in interpreting our own version of what is true. Um, we had this back and forth about um, absolute truth versus relative truth, like who decides what is true. Uh, and I think for any loyal Christian, God decides what is true. Um, when we are left alone to dictate what our own moral values should be, um, we have a tendency to want to choose more selfish things, to justify more selfish actions. And, uh, you know, you can twist words around any day to justify any evil um, or make it seem like that. So. I think having a relationship with God and having that spirit within you is what we weigh the what we think is the truth on. Um, sometimes we can be making decisions and be doing things that uh, we know are not good, and we could use logic and reason to to say, like, "Well, it's not that bad," or like other people have done worse things, and um, try to minimize, you know, our own shortcomings and evil doings and. Um, but we always know, I think, that there's something inside of us when we're doing something we're not supposed to be doing, um, a little voice in the back of our mind uh, that says you shouldn't be doing this. And uh, I was talking about, I guess, interpreting how you hear God's voice. And um, I think, you know, if the, the God, if God and the devil are both like, you know, those little um, things you see in like cartoons with like the angel and the devil on your shoulder, um, I think lots of times God doesn't yell. He's not going to yell at you and try to shout at you. God speaks in a whisper, kind of more in the back of your mind, walk this way. Where the devil, I guess, that evil incarnate is uh, yelling at you, saying like, no, you're wrong. This is, the bad, this is a bad choice. What you're doing isn't, doesn't work. isn't worth anything. It doesn't matter, you know. Um, so... Which is another reason why I just love um, the Quaker lifestyle is that taking the time to find truth in the silence. 
um, quieting your mind and all those other voices that say you're walking the wrong way or when you, when you actually are walking the right way um, and make you doubt yourself. Um, and I deal with that a lot. So I'm sure this, everybody in this room deals with self-doubt and confidence issues sometimes and not knowing if we're doing the right thing or not. But um, I don't know. The truth is not complicated. The truth is simple. And um, I think it's easier to determine whether we're doing the right thing when we remember that. Thank you. It's Nancy. Nancy, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, um, I hear this phrase more and more in society, and I think it's an excuse for not living as we're supposed to, but you hear, oh, they're living their truth. She's living out her truth. Well, there's only one truth, and that is the Lord's truth. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> We've, we're privileged to have some younger friends with us today. I was really hoping I could twist their arms into talking about why truth is so important in families, why truth is so important in school. But they were bashful and didn't want to say anything. It is about four minutes to the top of the hour. We'll wait for a couple more minutes. If there are any who know that you should speak, please do so. We'll just wait quietly. Please obey that prompting if it's there. If all hearts are clear, we'll close this time with a hymn, and this will be number 351 in the hymnal, Moment by Moment, I'm Kept in His Love. Moment by moment, I've life from above. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine, moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine.
number 351. Thank you very much. Just a closing thought about this topic of truthfulness. My brother Dwight will smile when I say this, I think. He already smiled, and I haven't even said it. <laughs> Dwight, do you remember when we lived there on 4th Street, or uh, Wichita Avenue, rather, Wichita Avenue? Um, I remember that record player sitting there between the living room and the kitchen, sort of in that dining area. And we had an album that my parents bought for us kids when we were so young, but I'll bet it was still around when Dwight got to the age where he listened to that stuff. I don't remember what the deal was, but it had the story of Bambi, the little deer on it, and Bambi's mother taught Bammy, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Do you remember that, Dwight? He does remember. <laughs> Good. So I'm not making this up. There's what was behind the bonus question of, are there times when people use true information to hurt other people? The obvious answer is yes, they do. It really is a real thing. And I always think about, you know, what's the answer when, when you have true information that may just inflict horrible harm on somebody? Are you obligated to say that? I remember Bambi's mother. If you can't say something nice, just don't say nothing at all. It's another complicated twist of the simplicity of truth, Gage, <laughs> that sometimes it's better if we don't say anything rather than speak untruth or inflict horrible, unnecessary harm by wielding true information. Lots to think about as we enter into another week of ministry in our community. I not only was tempted to speak to the young people over here, I was also tempted to speak to the young person over here. Is honesty important in the 
practice of dentistry? I'll bet it is. We'll talk about that over a cup of hot cocoa sometime. Thank you, friends, for these excellent things that have been said. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with others who have been helped by what you shared today. God bless you all for that. Oh, I forgot to pick up my paper. Hold on. We need to be sure everyone knows what's happening around here this week. This will be a rather busy week, and we sure want to stress what's happening tomorrow evening. Today, however, um, we will have the trustees July meeting that will be at 3.30 p.m. today, either at the Parsonage or by Zoom. So trustees, please join us at 3.30 today, one way or the other, as we enter into a new church year and take up the business of our meeting. At 4.30 p.m. today, the Missions and Social Concerns Committee will gather also by Zoom or at the Parsonage if you'd like to come sit with us. And again, our first meeting of the new church here, 4.30 p.m. for Missions and Social Concerns. Tomorrow evening, Monday, the 17th of July at 7 o'clock by Zoom or here at the meeting house. I don't know if we figured out where we do it up here. We're probably, probably right back here in the sanctuary. Jay Marshall will be joining us um, in person here in the room to discuss and instruct a bit about the book that we, I think he finished writing it a couple of years ago, but it was in the middle of the pandemic and it was really hard to peddle books during the pandemic. So it's kind of gotten a late start. There's still a couple of copies over on the table over there. Jay will talk to us about the content of that book and some of the questions that it raises and why it is so important for us to be a discerning people, to hear the call of God and discern what we should do about that. So we would love to have everyone join us. This is an extension of our 150th anniversary celebration. Jay spoke to us earlier this year, and this is now in follow-up to that. So please join us tomorrow evening by Zoom or here in the meeting room at 7 o'clock, if at all you are able. On Wednesday this week, the Welcome Class Bible will meet, Bible study rather, will meet at um, 7 p.m. by Zoom to study lesson number three in the summer quarterly. The lesson is called Understanding the Parables. It's drawn from Mark chapter four. We welcome any and all to participate in the Bible study. If you need a quarterly or the Zoom link, just be sure and let us know and we'll get that to you. Simple reminder, there is an offering plate on the round table over in the parlor to receive contributions for supporting Winchester Friends Ministries. We thank you so much for your faithfulness and your stewardship in, in caring for the work of the church. Um, and those of you that may be interested in the book discussion group, not the one that we'll meet tomorrow, but the one that has been meeting all along, the book by Barbara Kingsolver is so thick that most of us didn't get through it. So the group is going to continue that discussion into the month of August. So if you would like to join the book discussion group in reading Demon Copperhead, um, a novel by Barbara Kingsolver, a really wonderful novelist, please let us know and we'll see to it that you get one of the books that the church has for loan. Um, also on Wednesday evening, there will be intercession salad supper at 5.30 p.m. at the Parsonage. We need to remind people that you are welcome to attend that as well. And next Sunday, we'll be right back here in the same place, same time, in the same manner. And we hope that you'll join us and we hope you'll bring a friend. Ellen, bring your family back again next week, okay? We'd really like that. On the prayer concern side of the sheet, Deborah Lilly is with us by Zoom today. Deborah is recuperating after having carpal tunnel surgery on her wrist. She's also undergoing some additional medical testing. Please pray for Deborah as that wrist heals up and as she goes through additional testing in the coming days. Terry Reinard has received medical attention and is following the instructions, doing his home therapy for respiratory illness. Please pray for his well being and improvement as he disciplines himself to do all those breathing exercises. We don't see the McFarlands today. I'm really hopeful that it doesn't mean that they have become ill. Diana was struggling a little bit with some digestive system trouble this week. Cleo is preparing for a surgery to correct spinal stenosis, which will be a fairly 
serious thing. So please be praying for both Cleo and Diana today. Please also pray for Ann Riddle, who is still working towards getting a laser treatment for a blood vessel problem in one of her eyes. Mary Williams, who has joined us by Zoom for many times over these past couple of years, was hospitalized in Muncie all week this past week for severe respiratory illness. She was dismissed, we believe, on Friday. We're not certain exactly of the day, but we think she was dismissed and sent to a rehab facility close to where her son lives in Carmel. The address is in our insert, and we'll be sure and share that tomorrow by email as well. We encourage you to send her a note of encouragement. She's at Bridgewater Healthcare Center on Cary Road in Carmel, and we'll be sure that you get that so you can write to her if you'd like to. Also remember Sue Painter, who is closing in on the end of July when she can see the ophthalmologist and get the process of getting cataracts removed underway. Please pray for her well-being and for her patience. John Engel and Anna Lou Arnett remain our two friends in nursing care. Um, John at Randolph Nursing Home and Anna Lou down at Friends Fellowship in Richmond. Please pray for both. Those of you who have this paper in the room today, um, Mary Clark was telling us just this morning that Jeff Clark got pretty encouraging news regarding some of the tests that he's gone through. And so their movement towards possible radiation has been at least delayed for a while, which is wonderful news that there is some improvement there. Our brother-in-law, Sam Schofield in Kansas City, has been to the doctors in the last several days. And I think the decision has been made by Sam and Rhonda that he will begin radiation treatments for remaining cancer sometime quite soon. So pray for Jeff, pray for Sam, pray for Linda Cover down in Texas, for Candy Carr in Columbus, Indiana, for Dale Schaefer, who's Susie Turner's brother over in Muncie, and others that you are aware of who are receiving treatment for cancer. We also put a note in today that um, we did not learn about this last weekend. We would ask the Lord to comfort Austin and Letha Cox and their family who are mourning the death on July the 6th of Austin's sister, Rowena Holly, a kind of mainstay in this community for many, many years. Please pray for Austin and Letha and their family. Remember to pray for family and friends who are on the road traveling long distances for summer vacations. We did get to see Jill Ash and her son Carl this week. They, Carl passed through here. He's been in Washington, D.C. for the last two years doing an internship at the National Institutes of Health. He is now moving back to San Diego, and he came here, and I think Jill is accompanying him at least as far as Colorado to keep him awake while he's driving. And then we're not sure from that point on whether they'll go by car or fly. But please pray that they will arrive safely in San Diego. They may be getting there today. It's been a long week for them. Pray for others as well. I know the Schofields have gone to Colorado and are vacationing there. So there are others as well that are out traveling around. As you become aware, please pray. Pray also when you watch these news reports of the horrific um, weather disasters that have happened, the tornadoes, the horrible flooding in the Northeast, all this excessive heat that is harming people, please pray that God will watch over people and protect them. And please continue praying for peace in a shattered world. So many places, so many people suffering. Ask the Lord to bless the world with peace. And a note I added this morning because I didn't think of it when we were preparing this yesterday, pray for a safe conduct of the Randolph County Fair here in Winchester and for the friends who are working out there in the hot kitchen and doing other things to make sure that that goes well. Just ask the Lord to sustain them all. Are there other concerns very briefly that we should all be praying about? You are welcome here in the room to tell me online. You'll need to unmute. Just wanted to let you know, Ron, uh, after much waiting and much delay, it'll be this Tuesday that she'll go in for her initial consultation with the actual eye doctor. So it's drawing near. Thank you. Tuesday. Very good. 
We will be praying. You let her know, okay? Anything else? Kendra, you can tell me and I'll pass it on. We will pray. Okay, so Dr. Holliger has told us that, first of all, she passed her state board of dentistry test and is well on her way to getting that white coat. And secondly, and she thanks everyone for your prayers for her during that stressful couple of days up in Lafayette. Secondly, she will be leaving, when is it that you go? The 23rd, so just at the end of this month, she will be going with other colleagues from the School of Dentistry. Are you going to Eagle Pass by chance? Laredo. Laredo. Going to Laredo, Texas, to the border area to do, I would assume, free dentistry for all of the migrants that are there, um, many of them in camps and being held there. So it will be a mission of mercy and really wonderful thing for Kendra to do and for her friends to do and a real help to a lot of people. She would appreciate your prayers for that to go well and safely. And she said it's the first time that the dental school has done this. I think it may be the first time we've had big camps of people down there on the border to do it for, but this will be an experimental deal. So pray for those who are in charge. Just pray that that will be a really wonderful and effective ministry to a lot of people. Anything else? Would you join me for a moment in prayer as we lift these things to the Lord? Let's pray. Lord, in the quietness of this moment, we ask that you would cement these things into our minds and into our hearts as we leave this place today, that we would carry these concerns and that we would be especially attentive to your spirit this week, especially attentive to your prompting that we should pray or that we should get involved in some way to be your hands and feet to those who are in need. We thank you for your presence with every person that is on this list your presence in every situation that is on this list and that we have talked about. We simply ask that you would express your love in beautiful and life-giving and miraculous ways in all those lives and situations, and that when it happens, people will know it was you and will give you the glory and the thanks and the praise. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege of being in worship together and of turning to you for the help that we need and that our friends need. We thank you for the ways that you've already answered so many of these prayers, the ways that you've helped us in the past. We thank you now for what you will do for all of these. We ask your blessing on this ministering community as we go back into our lives and work and homes, that we would always be agents of your truth in this world, and that we would indeed, because of you and your light within us, we would stand out like those bright stars in a dark sky. Help us to be those kinds of witnesses for you in the week ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay tuned for some music.
Thank you, Mary Clark. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. God bless you all. Thank you so much for being with us. Go in peace.